Good morning, Christ Covenant. And good morning to you watching us online. We're so glad to be able to worship together this morning. Thank you so much for being here. I want to, uh, first of all, just uh, praise the Lord for our Christmas Eve service. It was a great time uh, getting together. And uh, I think we had over 100 people uh, there at the service. And I uh, want to thank the volunteers. A lot of hard work went into putting that together and then tearing it down afterwards. Um, but uh, really want to thank you and just thank God for the opportunity to be able to, uh, to worship on Christmas Eve. Um, before I go to the worship and giving, I, I, I want to give a shout out to my good, my good friend and elder emeritus, John Russo. His birthday is tomorrow, so happy birthday, bro. All right. Also, uh, this coming week, you'll start getting emails and information about uh, 2021 ministries coming up. So keep your eyes out for that as we start unfolding uh, those, those ministries. We do thank you for your worship and giving and pray that you will continue to give into the Lord his tithes as well as our offerings and alms. And pray that you would really just, uh, just reevaluate your giving, of course, as we get to the end of the year. And uh, any way that you can continue to uh, support the church, we really do appreciate, appreciate that. Our call to worship on this morning is from Psalms 102, verses 18 through 22. Hear now the word of God as he calls us to worship this on his Lord's day. This will be written for the generation to come that a people yet not created may praise the Lord. For he looked down from his holy height and from the heaven the Lord looked upon the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner to set free those who were doomed to death that, so that they would tell of the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples gather together and the kingdoms serve the Lord. So we're part of what the prophet is talking about here in this passage. We come here to praise the Lord. So let us stand together and let us worship God. Good, good father, it's who you are. 
Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, our God, we, your people, have gathered in this place on this Lord's Day to give you praise and thanksgiving. For, Lord, you have written down for us, for the generation to come, a people that you have created, that we might gather in this place to praise you. You have looked down from your holy height. You looked down upon the earth and saw that we were groaning as prisoners. And you, Lord, have determined to set us free from the doom of death. We thank you for your love and your mercy and grace upon us. And thank you for sending your son, our Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, thank you for doing all things to please the Father, doing all things to accomplish to accomplish all things for our salvation so that we can rest completely in you and your work for us. Lord, we thank you for sending your Holy Spirit into us that we might truly tell of your name of the Lord. We might give you praise and gather together as your people and to serve you. And we pray, Lord, that you would enable us to do that more and more and more. Lord, as we look forward to the new year, we pray that you would truly equip us and cause us, Lord, to be able to do all of your holy will. Thank you, Lord, for sustaining us during this time, this last year. And, Lord, we look forward for the goodness of the, of the Lord in this place in the coming year. Lord, today we ask that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word. We pray, Lord, that you would work newness into our hearts, that we might truly be a people that would praise you. Lord, in setting us this, we are mindful to pray forth the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, the children are dismissed to Children's Church, and you may be seated. I want to thank uh, Bridget for filling in for uh, Richie this morning. He, he uh, came down with a little cold and such and uh, felt that it was better for him not to be here. And thanks to the team that uh, has come together and a great time of worship. Amen. Amen. So today we have a, a guest speaker, uh, Daniel Perez. And Daniel is going to uh, share, I'll let him share about his family. But uh, Daniel and his wife and his two little girls have been attending here at Christ's Covenant uh, about for a little over a year now or so. Um, Daniel uh, studied for about a year and a half at uh, Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando. And uh, after starting to attend here, he found out about Lamp Theological Seminary and is now currently enrolled there and has taken about six classes or so. An excellent student. Now, some of you might not know anything about LAMP. LAMP is an acronym that stands for Leadership and Ministry Preparation. LAMP uh, Seminary is actually birthed from this church back in the early 90s, and that and the desire for us to be able to train men for the gospel ministry. And then after a period of time, the denomination felt, found out about it and asked us to be able to take it nationally. And currently, we have about 100 students across the country and over about 45 graduates, all majority of them ordained in the PCA. Now we see that within Christ's Covenant, Christ's Covenant has a heritage of training up um, pastors and preachers. We've, uh, this, we've been able to train six um, pastors that be able, with, served within this church, and we've been able to train six other pastors who serve in churches within this presbytery or within Dade and Broward County. So from this church so far, we've been able to raise up uh, 12 uh, ministers of the gospel, and we look forward to seeing God work in Daniel's life, Daniel Perez, as well in Daniel Young's life in the years to come. Amen? Amen. So uh, with no further ado, let me just introduce Daniel to come and preach God's word for us. Let's give the Lord praise. Good morning, Christ Covenant. Good morning. 
My name is Daniel Perez, as uh, Pastor Brian mentioned. Thank you for the kind introduction. I think I'm probably going to repeat most of the things he said, but uh, first of all, it's a joy to be gathered with you all this morning. It is a privilege for me to be able to bring God's Word uh, to you all. And as many of you know, Bridget is my wife. She's normally behind the piano today. She was able to stand behind the guitar in uh, Richie's absence, and so I'm grateful for that and to see her there. Um, we have two daughters, Zoe and Evelyn, in the children's ministry. We are very grateful for the children's ministry and just taking care of them. And they've been at home there um, with all the toys and everything. So that's been a blessing to our family. Uh, we started attending Christ Covenant at the beginning of 2020, the very first service in January. And now we're currently in the membership process, or, or maybe we're members. I have to ask Pastor Brian. Uh, <laughs> Christ's covenant uh, has truly been a blessing to our lives and an answered prayer in so many ways. Uh, so we're very grateful for all of you and just very eager to continue to meet many of you. Um, this morning we start a new mini-series called All Things New. As we close 2020, the series aims to address what our mindset should be going into 2021. Our passage for this morning comes from Isaiah 43, verses 16 through 21. But before jumping in, I want to offer three points to help orient us with this text. The first is that Isaiah is a prophetic book. It was written around 700 B.C. In our text this morning, Isaiah is speaking 200 years into the future to God's people, roughly around 500 B.C., so before Christ. Second, Isaiah is addressing Israel's exile and captivity at the hands of the Babylonians. What's interesting is that at the time that he is writing, Babylon is not even on the map. They're not a major player in the world, so they're not much of a concern for them. The major player, the major threat is Assyria because they conquered northern Israel roughly in 722 B.C. Yet Isaiah's main message is that though God's people may be in exile, that God is still faithful to them because they are his chosen people. Though they are far from their land, their city lies in ruins, the temple has been destroyed, God is the ever-present God. He is with his people and he is faithful to his people. This is his promise for us this morning, and this is his promise for us turning into 2021. Amen? Amen. So let us turn to our text this morning. Hear now the word of God. This is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my chosen people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. This concludes the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Uh, my wife and I recently closed on a house in uh, Cooper City, and after signing and getting the keys, my first concern was getting a security system. Uh, I got all the bells and whistles, and I probably got suckered into getting far more than I needed. But my main concern, uh, my main priority was our safety, the safety of our kids and our security. Um, to give some background, in our previous home, we knew the area well. We lived with a gated community, and we had security guards roaming around the area. Now we found ourselves in an area that we're still not too familiar with. We no longer have a gate, and there's no security guard anymore. And while we understand that God is chiefly the one that watches over us and keeps us in our coming and our going, we believe it was wise and right to do our part and get the security system. Similarly, Isaiah was addressing a future people who would be exiled in a foreign land, away from their city walls, enslaved by the Babylonians without their security guard, the Lord, since the temple represented God's presence with his people, but the temple is now destroyed and the ruins laid in Jerusalem. Their doubts and fears were expected, and we could even say reasonable. Imagine if the Babylonians could conquer God's chosen people and drag them from their home and bring them to worship other foreign gods, 
The Israelites surely had concerns and doubts about their God, and some might even have questioned if the Babylonian gods were greater than Yahweh himself. Yet, what we find in our text this morning is that the Lord had a new word for his people. Though they were under a foreign power, they were still his people. Though they were far from the promised land, the Lord was near to them. Though they doubted his ability and commitment to them, the Lord remains all-powerful, sovereign, and faithful to his people. How exactly does the Lord, through the prophet Isaiah, encourage a disconnected, defeated, and doubtful people? We read in verses 16 through 17 that the Lord draws their attention to the first exodus out of Egypt. We read, this is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Why remind them of the first exodus? He does this to remind his people that he has delivered their ancestors from the sea and the Egyptians. Against all odds, the Lord delivered his people from exile and enslavement and conquered their enemies. This was not a one-time act. While the exodus is the greatest redemptive event recorded for us in the Old Testament, it primarily pointed to their God, Yahweh, as the God of the Exodus. In these verses, the Exodus points to God's pattern. It's His M.O., His mode, His method. The Lord is our deliverer. Amen. We see this pattern time and time again in the Scriptures as the Lord conquers many nations as Israel enters the Promised Land in the book of Joshua. The Lord goes before them and delivers them from their enemies time and time again. In Judges, we see that the Lord raises a new judge to deliver his people when they cry out to him and return to him. Again, this is his pattern. He is our deliverer. Like any good parent, he is near to his children. He hears their call and he is ready to free them from their circumstances and to bring them home. My daughters, whenever they get any sort of bump or scrape, they come running either to myself or to my wife and they'll point to their injury and they'll say, yay, yay, which is a Spanish for saying boo-boo. They want to let us know what happened to them so we could offer some relief, so we can comfort them. And it's normally just giving them a kiss on their yay, yay. They know how we were responsible. They keep coming to us. We've, been, we've consistently done this, so they keep coming. And in the same way, the Lord reminds his people how he responded in the past and how he will act again in their lives in the present. But we see an interesting turn in verse 18. After reminding his people of the Exodus, the Lord immediately says, Do not call to mind former things or ponder things of the past. If we just glance at this text, it seems like the Lord is telling his people to do one thing in verses 16 through 17, and yet to do the exact opposite thing in verse 18. So what exactly is going on? Well, another important point that the Lord draws out and have hinted out already is that while he reminds his people of his mighty works in the past, which is cause for praise and celebration, the Lord is telling his people not to remain stuck in the past. And why? For one, it is easy to romanticize the past because it is distant and removed. And in fact, it is distant in many ways. But we believe in the Lord of the now. And again we read, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. Surely this was the case with God's people. In the wilderness narratives after the Exodus, we find very quickly that the people desire to return to Egypt because they find the trials in the wilderness greater, or they find it as a greater trial than being slaves to the Egyptians themselves. They want to go back. But we, all, but we all see the Lord is pressing a point here in this quick transition that is even closer to the heart. It is a good and right thing to thank the Lord for all that he's done, and we are commanded and commended to do this in the scriptures in many ways. Yet, we should have faith that the Lord who has done mighty deeds for us continues to do great things in the present. We should have an eager expectation that the Lord is at work in our lives now. The point is that the Lord reminds us that He is the God of the Exodus. It is not so much the event itself He draws attention to, but to Himself, to His power, to His love for us, that He desires to deliver His people and He promises 
to do so again. As we await the new year and reflect on 2020, first of all, thank God that in many ways it's over and it's behind us. <laughs> but more importantly, the Lord has been faithful despite the pandemic, despite an election year, and despite concerns about the future. He has been faithful in different ways and through different means, but he cares for us all and calls us to bring all doubts and fear before him. We are not called to set fear and doubt aside and ignore them altogether. More importantly, we are called to take them to our Lord through prayer and supplication. We can trust that God is with us today because he has been faithful to his people throughout the ages, and all who turn to him, he hears and receives. The same God who overcame the Egyptians and the Red Sea is the same God who promised to bring his people out of Babylon, and he's the same God with us today. Amen? As the Lord anticipates the weaknesses and doubts of his people, he lavishes them with promises of deliverance and protection. We see in verse 19 that the Lord says through the prophet, Behold, I will do something new. What is this new thing? We read that the Lord will make roadways in the wilderness for his people. Here God alludes to the wilderness that separates Judea and Babylon. God was promising his people a new road for them to be able to return home. While this is a new work, it is following old patterns, as I mentioned before. But it affirms what we understand from the previous verses, that God is the present God that continues to deliver his people, providing a new way according to the circumstances. Isaiah also adds that God will make rivers in the desert and that the animals will glorify the Lord. God promises these things in anticipation of his people's needs. He will provide rivers to give them drink. He will restrain the animals to cause them to glorify God as they give his people safe passage through the wilderness. The Lord promises not just a good ending, but that he will be with his people every step of the way. He promises the end by providing for their means. This morning, I want to encourage you and remind you that the Lord knows what we need even before we ask him. The Lord knows what we need even before we begin the journey. He does all this because the Lord is our great shepherd who guides us through right paths, and he comforts us through the darkest of valleys. He also anticipated their needs in the wilderness and ours today, not because he foresaw their complaints, but because he knows our frame. He knows all of our frames. He knows that we are dust, that we are frail. As a gracious father who shows compassion toward his children, he comforts us and provides for our needs. He is ready to bind our wounds, to soothe our ailments. He is tender and he is gentle towards us. Back in 2018, my wife and I attended a conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And up until the first day of the conference, the weather forecast was set for 35 days the first day of the conference, and 45 days, then 55, or sorry, 45 degrees and 55 degrees on the third day. So sure enough, on the first day, it was high 30s with no snow. But the following days, rather than going up 10 degrees every single day, the weather started to go back 10 degrees and get colder. And by the third day, we found ourselves in 15-degree weather with a few inches of snow and our four-month-old daughter at the time. We were unprepared, to say the least. We wanted to go straight back to Florida. And we were, in a sense, in the hands of the Weather Channel, and our daughter was in our hands. And what was the problem? We put our confidence in the Weather Channel. We didn't plan for a different outcome. Brothers and sisters, you can rest assured that our Heavenly Father, unlike the Weather Channel, makes no mistakes and He does not give a poor forecast over your lives. <laughs> His word and promises for us are sure and true and trustworthy. Just as the Lord reminded His people from Babylon, or delivered His people from Babylon 200 years later and brought them safely home, as promised in this passage, we have received the greater eternal redemption in Jesus Christ. Salvation in Jesus is the new thing anticipated from the beginning and the thing anticipated in our passage this morning. While their return from Babylon proved less glorious than expected, as recorded for us in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, the triumph of Christ over sin and death as God incarnate is light years beyond the exodus from Egypt and return from Babylon. It is truly a new thing, a new work. 
And we see in this passage, salvation is more than a one-time event. The Lord guarantees both our eternal end and the means. He is the one that brings to completion the work of salvation that He begins in our lives. He is the one that holds us fast and keeps us firm to the end in Christ. Jesus is our great shepherd who promises that no one can snatch us from His hand. Yes, we have a Lord and Savior who died in our place in the past. And yes, we have a Savior who goes before us to prepare a future eternal home for us. But we also have a present Savior who is intimately involved in our lives, who knows every hair on our heads and every concern that we all carry with us. He knows that 2020 has not been easy for most, yet He remains near. He has not abandoned us. He carries us through our present trials, holding us firm to the end. And in light of all this, a simple question remains, which is why? Why does the Lord do all of this for His people? At the end of our passage for this morning, we receive the answer to this question. We read at the end of verse 20 through 21, He does this to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. The Lord is jealous for His people because He is jealous for His praise. To understand this correctly, he is not jealous out of fear or envy. He rightly deserves all the glory for the redemption that he accomplishes and applies to our lives. He alone parted the Red Sea and delivered our ancestors from the hands of the Egyptians. He alone delivered his people from Babylon against all hope. He alone provided for them in the wilderness. Christ alone bore our sins on the cross, and Christ alone satisfied the legal demands of the law, and Christ alone reconciled us to God, and again, Christ alone brings us into His eternal love and life. In this passage, we see that God alone delivers His people because He has chosen them that they may proclaim His praises and be witnesses to His mighty works, and therefore He alone deserves and receives all of our praise and worship. Amen? Amen. In the New Testament, we read, In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He blessed us in the Beloved. And again we read, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. It is important for us to understand that just as God guarantees our salvation in Christ and provides for our needs along the way, He also guarantees His praise from His people. While God's act of choosing His people serves His purposes of salvation, the end of our election is the praise and worship of our great God. John Calvin rightly notes, This then is the end of our calling that being consecrated to God, we may praise and honor Him during our whole life. The praise of His name is not a secondary matter in this text, nor is it optional for our lives. It is our privilege, it is our joy, and it is our duty as His people. Just as the Israelites found themselves surrounded by foreign nations and their foreign gods, we find ourselves being pulled hundreds of different ways in this life, yet our God calls us to Himself through the prophet Isaiah, reminding us of our singular focus and purpose, which is the praise of His glorious grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Christ we have freedom and confidence to offer offer thanksgiving and worship to our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen? After my wife and I had our security system installed, she expressed to me that she was still a little worried Uh, about the security of our home and kids, and part of that is doubt concerning the unknown. But it is also the reality that while our security system may have 24-7 monitoring and many other features, there is no 100% guarantee that it will prevent and deter all crimes and incidents. No one can offer us that. But the Lord promises to be much more than a round-the-clock monitoring system. He is near to us. He is our present God. He guards us and watches over our lives. From our text, we get that the God of the Exodus is with us. That while He may not keep us from the wilderness in our lives, He keeps us through the wilderness. 
He sustains us and walks with us, and we can trust in His promises for our lives, that He completes the work of salvation and guarantees the praise of His name. Brothers and sisters, many may our many doubts not drive us away from the Lord, but may we draw all the more to Him, knowing that our circumstances may not feel sure or certain at times, yet He is our faithful God who does not abandon us. May we also trust and expect God's new and continual work in our lives. And may we also be a people that are ready to praise His name. All of His many mercies for us are worthy of our worship. As we stand in the threshold of a new year, I pray that we will be reminded that the Lord is our deliverer, that the Lord is the Lord of the now, that He is our provider, always making a way, always making a way where there seems to be no way, and the Lord is to be praised. Why? Because He is making all things new. Let us pray. God, our Father, we praise your name because you are the ever-present God. You have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. You sent your Son to die in our place, and you sent your Holy Spirit to be with your people, to comfort us, and to draw us near to yourself. For those, for those of us present that find themselves without hope, that find themselves in a wilderness without a way forward, May they surrender their lives at the foot of the cross, casting their worries on Christ. May they draw near to you, O Lord. For those of us who are your children, we pray that you continue to walk with us and encourage us all the days of our lives. We pray for your daily grace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Your 
Lord praise. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. You made a preacher proud. All right. If there's any way that we can be of assistance to you, we offer ourselves to you to help you in any way so we might truly grow in the Lord together. That we might really look forward to God doing great things in 2021. Amen? Amen. Making all things new. Praise the Lord. Our call to prayer is actually one of the New Testament references that Daniel had in his sermon. Comes from, um, uh, oh, oh yes. Oh, my, oh no, it's not the one he gave in the sermon. I'm sorry, this is the one I came up with. Well, God actually came up with it. So it comes from Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I think this is a great verse as we look forward to the new year, amen? amen. Receive now this declaration from God's word as we each go our own way, here now, the word of God. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen. Your perfect law exposes me.